Hi, shofars that tell stories, the Jerusalem summit in the Philippines, and a circus that came to Israel and brought happiness to sick children. All this and our weekly insight on this week's program, 22 seconds and we'll be starting. Shalom and welcome to Israeli Salad. Rabbi Samson recently spoke to us about the shofar. The shofar is a ram's horn that is blown on Rosh Hashanah. One of the most important mitzvot of Rosh Hashanah is hearing the 100 sound blasts coming from the shofar in the synagogue. Participants in the prayer service hear the sound of the shofar and connect with their inner cry to God. Rabbi Huda Mutsafi is an expert in the art and heritage of the shofar and he collects shofars from all around the world. As part of a special prayer service that took place at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, Yehuda Mutsafi blew one of his traditional shofars. This shofar is one of many in Yehuda Mutsafi's collection. Since he was young, Yehuda Mutsafi has been teaching the art and heritage of the shofar. Year after year, he collected shofars from many different sources, and today, Yehuda is invited regularly to many institutions to present his shofars and tell their stories. We visited Yehuda Mutsafi at his Jerusalem home and learned of the diversity in the world of shofars. Here we see a spring-like shofar. It's a ram's right horn. The bone from inside is extracted. This 200-year-old shofar is from Morocco. It has carved verses from the Tanakh. On one side, sound a great shofar for our redemption. And on the other side, on that day, a great shofar shall be sounded. The more you blow a shofar, and the older it gets, the better sound it can produce. The shofars in Yehuda Mutsafi's collection sometimes recall memories from historical periods in Jewish history, like the shofar he received from a Holocaust survivor. A Jew who was on a train on his way to be murdered at the death camps had the shofar with him. He called his fellow Jew over and said, we know this is our end, please take the shofar. The sound of the shofar is like a cry. In the days of the British Mandate, it was forbidden for Jews to use a shofar at the Western Wall. But the youth of those days found ways to trick the authorities. They would take the shofar and hide it under their shirts and run to the Western Wall. No one would see that they had a shofar. At the western wall, they would find someone who could blow the shofar. When the British heard the shofar, the kids would give the shofar to an old woman. She would take the shofar, put it up here, cover it with a cloth, and if someone stopped her, she'd show her bag that contained nothing suspicious. On the other hand, this shofar I could put in my small pocket and no one would notice. But anyhow, the sound is not strong enough, not everyone in the Western Wall could hear it. This shofar is kosher. It's from a young ram. I'm trying to find the world's biggest shofar. I checked to see if there are any new big shofars that came in from Africa. This is probably the second biggest shofar in the world. The biggest one is in the Israel Museum. It's 124 centimeters long. This one is 112. Not all the shofars in Yehuda's collection fit the standards of Jewish halacha and are fit for use to fulfill the mitzvah of shofar. This is a shofar. It's a deer horn. The purpose of the shofar is to use as a flask for wine. It's preferable not to use this shofar because it's straight. We want the shofar to be bowed like we should be when we pray. 
Although Yehuda Mutsafi hears the sound of the shofar frequently, he is moved each year by the shofar on the high holidays. The shofar is heard from before Rosh Hashanah until the end of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the shofar is sounded at the end of the prayer service. We take a long breath, blow strongly, and we know and believe that God has accepted our prayers. Now we could go home to eat after the fast. We go home from the mitzvah of praying and continue with the mitzvah of preparing the sukkah for the upcoming festival of Sukkot. In the past few years, Israel has been finding a lot of support from Christian groups, mainly in the United States. Now Israel is finding Christian support from another part of the world, Southeast Asia. A conference was recently held in Manila to pool the efforts of these groups as a unified front. From time to time we've presented stories showing Christian groups or individuals who believe they have a moral obligation to stand behind Israel. An organization called the Jerusalem Summit has been working to consolidate and expand these groups. We, we created the Jerusalem Summit to get together Israel's friends from around the world. When we had an inaugural Jerusalem Summit last year uh, in October 2003 in Jerusalem, we got together the best minds and Middle East experts from the United States, from Europe, when it turned out that participants from Asia were so much inspired by our endeavor that they created their own Jerusalem Summit Asia, who support Israel, who understand that radical Islam is a global threat, and they called their righteous forum Jerusalem Summit. Asian leaders from seven countries met in the Philippines for the first annual Jerusalem Summit Asia. Representatives from South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Philippines, and India adopted a resolution of support for Israel. The resolution has three points. First, petitioning their governments to move their embassies from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Second, petitioning their governments not to vote against Israel in the United Nations. And third, to petition their governments not to sponsor Palestinian Authority. Or, if they still transfer money there, scrutinize that these money are used only for humanitarian objectives and not for terrorism and for incitement to terror. Knesset member Yuri Stern was part of the delegation from Israel that attended the conference. Uh, Far East and Asia are the countries uh, with growing uh, pro-Zionist uh, Christian uh, communities and groups. And uh, uh, this particular meeting uh, was very important uh, as a tool uh, for in strengthening those links and uh, uh, consolidating uh, different groups and personalities uh, who support us from the Christian point of view. Of course, the inertia, uh, the inertia and the dependence of Arab on Arab oil, uh, pressure of Arab countries. For example, uh, these Asian countries they have millions of their workers uh, being employed in Arab countries. Uh, it seems to me that at least in Philippines and in some other. Uh, countries of the region, uh, these Christian groups and congregations are going to be a very important political force uh, that will help uh, the state of Israel to break uh, the isolation uh, that our enemies are trying to establish around us. Dimitri was inspired by the summit in the Philippines. P people were coming to me at the Jerusalem summit in the Philippines and saying, are you Jewish? I said, yes. They said, yes, we hope to see the first Jew, uh, a live Jew. And another couple came to me and said, may we take a picture because you are from Israel. You are the first Israeli and we pray, are praying for Israel three times a day. We're so glad to see Israelis. In some countries there are millions of people who pray for Israel daily. In some there are thousands. But it is there. And it is growing. When we return, the circus comes to town. Please send your comments, ideas and questions to the Israeli Salad email. Yoni at IsraelNN.com or leave a message on the Israeli Salad voicemail at international dialing code 972-3-918-5554. That's 972-3-918-5554. 
And now let's meet an internationally renowned circus that came to perform in Israel to show support and to bring happiness to sick children. We joined the Monte Carlo Circus in a performance they held at Schneider Children's Hospital in Petah Tikva. The Monte Carlo Circus was founded in the 1800s by the Balkansky family. Today, Alexander Balkansky, seventh generation of the family, is the owner of the circus. Alexander, who himself was born in a circus tent, brought his circus to perform in Israel. Israel is a very nice country. I like Israel. I was first time with the circus here in Israel, 1966. Alexander is a great supporter of Israel and the Jewish people and he has contributed on many occasions to different organizations and institutions in Israel. Alexander's occupation in the circus business helps him feel safe and secure when visiting Israel. What is the danger here? Our profession in the circus is also danger. We risk our life to bring a little bit of joy and happiness to the people. So what is the danger here? The Schneider Hospital is famous for its professional and unique attitude towards children's medicine. In addition to caring for the hospitalized children's physical condition, the hospital helps the children by offering many social activities and emotional help and support. As part of these activities, the Monte Carlo performance is seen as a direct contribution to the children's health. There is a drug that is called laughter and the smile and it cures everything and we are sure it brings them very well and it makes them better and feel better and forget all their trouble. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, make them uh, happy. We love to come and uh, to perform from them. The children need to be happy. So everywhere, every town, every country, we do our best, I do my best to bring a little bit of happiness to enjoy these children. After the main performance, which took place in the lobby of the hospital, the circus artists strolled through the wards to give all the children, even those who cannot leave their beds, the opportunity to enjoy the Monte Carlo Circus. You are watching Israeli Salad on Israel National TV. And now our weekly insight. Rabbi Samson joins us from Jerusalem. Shalom Rabbi Samson. Shalom Yoni, shalom to all of our viewers. I wanted to talk to you today about one of the main aspects of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the fast. What's the idea behind not eating on Yom Kippur? How does this contribute to the process of repenting? Yoni, when I uh, don't eat for uh, just a couple hours, and it usually strikes me around Yom Kippur about four or five hours into the day, I recognize the fact that I'm mortal and that when I eat three meals a day I think that I'll just live forever and it's something that has an unbelievable effect on a person that when he doesn't eat for just a few hours he doesn't drink for just a couple of hours all of a sudden he feels his body beginning to wither and die and it has a tremendous impact on his recognition that we're mortal and that uh, we're here only thanks to a little bit of food and water and that uh, it's time to repent because who knows when. Thank you very much, Rabbi Samson. The Weekly Insight is brought to you in cooperation with Mahon Meir, the largest Zionist institute in Israel, bringing people closer to Judaism. That's all for this week. We'll end with music from a special Philharmonic concert of Chabad music. The song we'll hear is called the Geula, the Redemption March. This video is part of the 100 Years of Chabad album produced by Noam Productions. So join us again next week for another program. Until then, from all of us here at Israel National TV, Shalom. <laughs>